All right, good morning. morning. Welcome, good to see everyone here. If you had a great week, uh, things are moving on or pressing into spring. Is tomorrow the first day of spring? Is that right? I think someone said that. I don't know, but we're moving on ahead. And uh, this morning, you know, I, I got up out of bed. I'm just like, all right, man, it's going to be an energized it's a good day, and it's full of energy, and then the fast forward about, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes later, I am digging through garbage elbow deep, because something got thrown away that shouldn't got thrown away, and so, and so I couldn't find, and like, oh, so I go outside in the garbage cans, and I'm pulling the garbage open, and I'm digging through all this wet, gross garbage, and of course, yesterday, there was taco salad thrown in the garbage cans, of course, it wasn't just dry paper, some, and all this mess, and then I, I, oh, just, so my morning didn't start off the way I had anticipated, but you know what? It happens, and we move on. Bigger, bigger issues in life, and so just you know, if you ever have one of those mornings, just know it may not always go as smooth, but you just keep moving on. And we are here this morning, and we're delving into the Book of Ephesians. That is our book we are in, in our journey through the Bible, and we are pressing forward. You know, we're pretty soon going to come to uh, the close of the journey that we've been through. We probably started uh, oh, probably about a year or so ago or maybe a little more than a year, where we've been working through all of our books, and we're almost to the end of our journey, and hopefully you're uh, uh, having a better understanding of, this, of the Bible and how to read it. So, let's begin. As usual, uh, author of the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, uh, date of writing about 60 to 63 AD, and the purpose of writing, well, Paul is writing from prison in Rome, and he's uh, writing to this church to equip the church and uh, to present a balanced view of the body of Christ. And he's writing to the church in Ephesus, just so you are aware of that. Uh, the church in Ephesus, well, Ephesus was a very wealthy city, um, very wealthy, but it also had a lot of pagan temples to pagan gods. One of them was Diana, uh, also called Artemis. And so there was a lot of things going on there. And Paul is going to, to address. Actually, it's interesting, is if you go to the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus addresses the church in Ephesus. And he says that you have lost your or left your first love, meaning him. They've, they've walked away from him. And he says because of that, their lampstand will be taken down. And we see that happen. The church uh, that started off so strong and vibrant eventually, you know, falls away. Uh, and so you see actually Jesus addressing the church in, in Ephesus. But nevertheless, that who the church in, in Ephesus is who Paul is writing this letter to. Um, and you know, many people call this Paul's summary book, where he kind of summarizes the gospel and, and the plan for, uh, that God had from all time. And if you're ever feeling down or discouraged, or if you ever wonder, does God care? Does, does God really care about me? If you ever feel that way, the book of Ephesians should uplift you because there's a lot of good stuff in here. It is um, one of those books where it really will kind of put things into perspective, the gospel of who God is and his plan for you. Now, when you read the book of Ephesians, it's a short book, not a very long book. Uh, many people will divide the book into two sections, the first section being the, the doctrine kind of section, um, and the second section of the book being more like practical application. Uh, I'm going to do is, you know, I, in my studies through the week, you know, I do some studies and commentaries, and of course I read through the entire book every week, whatever book we're in, I read through it all, I study commentaries, and then I even listen to other pastors as well. I'm going to provide an outline, I really enjoyed the outline um, Skip Heitzig gave, where he divides it into three sections, and so this morning we'll do our walk through Ephesians into three sections of a better understanding of what this book is all about. So, let's jump into it this morning. The first section, chapters one through three. This is what we'll call the wealth of the believer. As a believer, as a follower of Christ, you're very wealthy. You might think, really? All right, let's hear about this. I could go for some wealth. Well, let's see what Paul says here. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 4. says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Then we'll go to verse uh, 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and the things in, um, on earth. So this phrase, in Christ, 
Paul really wants you to know here in Christ. He wants you to know that because in Christ, you're wealthy. In Christ, we are wealthy. And so he wants, what he wants you to see, what he wants the Christian to see is, listen, you have so many spiritual blessings, you have so much wealth that you can't even imagine, right? That all, all of God's power you have at your disposal. And so we, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling discouraged, you should, number one, realize, you know what? Things might not be good, but guess what? God, God created me. He loves me. Uh, in Christ, He has redeemed me, right? He, he says that He has given us all spiritual uh, blessings, uh, that in His riches of grace, right, that He lavished upon us. Like, when you, when you thought, if you thought about this, and so that's, that's one section here He wants you to see is that, and, and then guess what else? He says, you've been chosen, you've been adopted, you've been redeemed. Does that excite you? Doesn't seem like it to me. You're like, well, come on, I want some, I want some money. Maybe some Bitcoin. I don't know. No, he, he, he loves you. He cares for you. Like, when you think about that, like, when you stop for a second and just realize the creator of the universe chose you, he adopted you into his family, and he redeemed you in Christ. When you really grabbed the magnitude of that, you, you can start off your day digging through garbage elbow deep and say, you know what? I'm still blessed. I still got spiritual blessings. I still got goodness. You know what I mean? And so when you think about that, we don't. We often want to think about what we don't have or, or how someone wronged us or how we're having a bad day or whatever it might be. And yeah, we have challenging times, but Paul wants the church to say that you are wealthy. You know why else you're wealthy? Because of the forgiveness that God has offered us, like His mercy and grace. Look what it says here um, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince and power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God has forgiven us, right? That, that even though we have rebelled, and even though we are sinful, and even though we live in a broken, sinful world, right? We have forgiveness offered to us. Even back in the previous verse that talked about when the, at the end of time when God's going to restore all things what, to the perfect way he intended it to be, uniting all things to himself. That's good news. That's riches that far outlast anything we can try to acquire here, right? So you're, you're chosen by God. You're adopted into his family. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. Like, are you starting to see what Paul is saying? Like, look at the wealth you have. Right? Maybe you don't have a lot of physical possessions or, or whatever, but you have a wealth that, de that decay is not going to see, right? That, the, that will not rot away. The money and the power and the things that we can acquire here is temporary, but there are spiritual blessings you have that you're not even aware of, right? That even the Bible says that the Spirit of God in a believer is indwelling. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead indwells in believers. But do you, are you aware of that? Are you walking in that? Are you operating in that? Right? Now, here's the question, because we live in a sinful world. We talked about that last week, right? That we, we all know, look around, the world is broken, it's messed up, it's, it's, it's um, full of sin, right? Um, when did God love us, though? Like, when did God start loving you? When did God start loving me? Um, was it when we started doing good things and being really good? Look what it says here. Paul answers that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us, in Christ Jesus. In verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Even when we were rebelling, even when we were lost in sin, even when we were just trying to be Lord of our own life, 
He still loved us, right? And you didn't earn it. Like, you didn't earn God's grace. You didn't earn his mercy. You didn't earn his forgiveness. You didn't earn your salvation, right? But we are, we're his workmanship. That's also pretty amazing. You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, you're not saved because you do good works, but you were created to do good works. And if you are saved, if you, if you are walking in a relationship with God, right? If you, are, if you are a disciple of Jesus, then you should be naturally be doing good works, right? Just the fruit last week we talked about, you know, a tree producing good fruit. Like, so if you are saved, you'll, you'll do these things naturally, naturally, but you're not saved because of those things. And he says, so as Christians, well, that's amazing, right? That he saved us even when we were rebelling, even when we were, and he says, um, we were dead in our trespasses, dead in sin, because sin kills, sin is destroying, sin, sin is death, right? I mean, sin is not just bad behavior, but actually ultimate sin leads to death, spiritual death. I mean, we know how being the world is under the curse of sin, right? But it was under the curse of sin, physical death entered the world. It wasn't intended to be that way. And so we saw the idea of people dying, right? Jesus comes. He reverses that curse um, in his death and resurrection. It's not yet fully happened yet because he's not returned yet. But just see that is not only is there physical death because of sin, but spiritual death. Sin leads to a separation from the Father, right? And so, but the good news is you have been saved and redeemed. There's an abundance of wealth in that. And you can't, you can't, um, you can't earn it. Paul is saying this, no matter what, we're all in the same boat without God's mercy and grace, right? And so in this context, it's Jew and Gentile, because remember that from last week, there was this debate they were having with the Galatians where the, the, the Judaizers were trying to tell these Christians they had to first become Jewish and then do all the Jewish rituals, and then plus Jesus to be saved. And Paul says, no, no, you're missing out. No, no, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, that's not what it's about. Uh, and so here he's talking about all one family united in Christ, Jew, Gentile. And you'll see sometimes in the Ephesians, he talks about this mystery, this mystery. Um, and he's talking about um, God's plan that was a mystery is now being revealed in Christ. It's always been God's plan from the beginning of time, but now it's being fully revealed, just so you're aware when you, when you read that, right? And, and uh, there's no second-class citizens. You were dead, but now you're alive because of what God has done. Which, man, that is good news. That is an abundance of wealth that I want us to see. Now go on to 11 through 13. We won't read it, but just go to, jump down to verse 13. He says, the last verse, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, obviously we know in the Old Testament they had um, the covenant, right? God had the, the covenant with the, the Jewish people. Uh, and uh, so many people... We're thinking, well, just the Jews are saved and the Gentiles, well, they're lost. Um, and uh, many, many people in this time had that mindset. Many people back then had that mindset. But Paul was saying, no, no, and in Christ Jesus, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You've been adopted into God's family, right? You, right here, you, me, we've been adopted into God's family. Not because we're so good and we've earned it, because of his mercy and grace and what he's done through his son, Jesus Christ. Now go on to 19 through 22. He says this, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him... You also are being built together into a dwelling place for the God by Spirit. And so, all together, right? That's Paul. Paul's talking about, remember last week? No more Greek, nor Jew, nor slave, nor free, nor male, nor female. All united in one in Christ Jesus. God is creating this one new humanity that is in Him, right? No more divided by... Um, race or nationality or political affiliation or whatever, but one day we're going to all gather down at that, at that big great banquet feast and we're just going to revel in the love of Christ. That's good news. That's good stuff. But look, look what he says here. Christ is the cornerstone. Meaning this is with Christianity and, and everything God is doing here, 
We might say today he is the foundation. He is the slab, if you will. Everything else is built on top of that, right? So you have Christ the foundation, then maybe you can build on top of that, you know, um, the ministry or the church, and then on top of that, like people working, um, us, you and me, and, and every, working in, in um, the kingdom stuff. It's all working together, right? And But it's got to be Christ the cornerstone. Anything else, if it's not Jesus-centered, it, it's not kingdom stuff. It's not the message of the gospel, and we've been through that before. Uh, chapter 3, you'll expand a little bit on this society, new society and the church and things like that, and talking about the, the mystery of God. But just know this, right? The first section, you are wealthy, right? Just know that. Meditate on this. I am wealthy. I am, it says you are seated right now in, with Christ in heavenly places. You are members of God's family, of this new coming kingdom. If that doesn't excite you, if that doesn't get you filled with joy and gratitude, you're thinking of the wrong stuff, right? Your mind is somewhere else. So I encourage you, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling discouraged, if you're wondering if God cares, right here, you know, God loves you. He cares for you. You are already rich and wealthy, spiritual blessings in Christ. You have been chosen. You have been adopted into his family. You have been redeemed, saved from death, even when you are rebelling, right? And now we all make mistakes, but um, I'm talking about when we were just apart from him, right? And so that's number one. You are wealthy. Now, there's only three sections. So section two, chapter four, this is the walk of the believer, right? The walk of the believer. Uh, go to Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. This is about our walk among other believers. So, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to which you were called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, walk worthy of your calling. So among the believers, but just in general, think about that. He's saying, okay, first of all, you're rich. You have everything you'll ever need already. God has already equipped you and blessed you, redeemed you. Uh, now, what are you going to do about that? How do you respond to that? You know? So, knowing you're wealthy, what do you ought to do about it? You better walk like it. Are you walking like you're wealthy? Are you walking like a disciple of Christ? You know? It's one thing to know something in your head, another thing to actually live it. Like, what you know should impact how you live. Right? This makes common sense. Like, all these, it's Christianity, all these doctrines and beliefs and theologies, guess what? It should make an impact in how you live your life. If not, what are you doing? I mean, the, even the Bible says, if you just hear the word and don't do the word, you're a fool. The Bible says that, right? And so, as we see this, knowing you're something doesn't guarantee you're going to live like it or act like it, you know? And we do this all the time, you know? Like, I know eating a whole Marie Calendar pie is not good for me. I eat a whole Marie Calendar pie in one, two settings, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's, it's like, I know, we know exercising is good for us. Do we actually do it like we should, you know? Like, we know we're smart people, you know? Um, we know the foods that are healthy for us to eat and that are good for our bodies. How many of you do that? If you don't, that would make you dumb, right? That would make me dumb, because if we don't, we know fruits and vegetables and things, good, processed garbage junk, high fat things, bad, what do we do? Usually the opposite, you know? And why? Because we go by feeling sometimes. Like, I don't feel like exercising. But we should exercise. It's the good thing to do. I don't always feel like eating healthy. It's the good thing, exercise and, and, and to eat healthy. You know, I, that's the thing. You, you might know something intellectually. All of us know all kinds of things intellectually that we shouldn't do. Guess what? We do it. We know things intellectually we should do. Guess what? We don't do it. There's a disconnect there, right? So, all right, if you know you're wealthy in Christ and, all, and, and the riches that are above, are you walking in that? Paul says what? 
I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, right? Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain unity in the Spirit, a bond of peace. Walk worthy of your calling. I mean, amongst believers right away, are you you living this way within the church? Patience, bearing with another in love, maintaining unity over trying to create division, right? Peace, patience, all of that. Or, no, gossiping, division, factions, um, rumors, anger, resentment, unforgiveness, manipulation. You're not walking worthy of your calling, right? You're doing a lot of damage in that. And so that's the one thing. So walking among believers, right? Are you walking worthy of your calling, right? Uh, go to Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. He says, well, actually, we're going to jump down to verse 11. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so now here, Paul's talking about um, gifts and the building up of the church. And so um, why does God give you these things? Right? So, and this is one translation. I think, I think I might have mistakenly used the ESV translation here. I'm not sure. I usually use the NIV translation. But regardless, because um, one translation is pastor and other different um, offices of the church. But God gave the church these things. The prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, pastors, teachers. Why? To equip the saints, that's you, for the work of ministry. Why? To build up the body of Christ. And until when? Until you meet the fullness of Christ, maturity, right? And so the biblical role of a pastor, you know, and all the other offices too, is what? To equip you for the work of the saints. People want to all kind of, they think they know what the biblical role of a pastor should be in their mind, right? They have all these lists. And you read the gospel. If you read what the Bible says, you read what Paul lives. It is my primary calling and role is to teach and equip you to go out of these doors and live and move towards the fullness of Christ doing kingdom work, right? You, you are the church. Like, you people are the church, right? So you come here. God's word is being sown, hopefully, in your lives. You can either receive it or reject it with a hardened heart. And you can go out of these doors, either live it or not live it. That's your choice, right? So I'm sowing the seed. What do you do with that seed? Go back to the good soil and bad soil, right? Is the enemy snatching it away as you're thinking all kind of negative thoughts and nasty thoughts and, and angry thoughts and you don't even hear it and your heart's hardened? Or are you receptive it's on good soil and you go out and, and the, the produce is produced tenfold, a hundredfold, right? That's the biblical principle. So we're being equipped, and why? The purpose here is this, is the church is to build up the body of Christ, right? Build, doing kingdom things that I always talk about that we see here. You know, we live in a culture now where it's all about the individual, right? I, my rights, my wants, my needs. Here, the value, the good of the group outweighs an individual, right? So we, the body of Christ, is already working together to build up the body of Christ. It's not about your preferences, not about your wants, your desires, your rights, your needs, right? We give that all up under Christ, right? Dying to self. And it's all to build up the body of Christ and to we're moving towards maturity, to fullness of Christ, becoming more Christ-like. Are you becoming more Christ-like or are you becoming less Christ-like, right? What are you walking in in this? And so... Uh, now, what about this? Okay, there's our walk amongst believers. What about the walk amongst unbelievers? How do we live our lives now? Knowing we're wealthy, knowing how we're called to walk among believers, how do you handle living in a world full of unbelievers? How do you walk? Paul says this in Ephesians 4, 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Hmm. He's saying, okay, you're not a part of that system anymore. Don't emulate the unbelievers, the, the, the people who are rebelling against God, the people who are just living lives full of sin. You're no longer part of that, right? And so, no longer walk that way. doesn't mean you can't talk to non-Christians or interact with non-Christians. No, I mean, because even Jesus did that, you know? Jesus did, did, did that. 
ate with tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, whatever. But he's saying, don't live like that. Don't live a sinful life like that, right? You're no longer part of that society anymore. Now you're part of God's family, right? Act like it. Walk like it. And then go on. And 22 to 24, he says, to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put off the or to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Saying, before you were a Christian, your old self, right? Now Put off that old self, put on the new self where you're walking in the Spirit, living a life of love, right? When people see you out of these doors, they should see something different, right? If you look like just the rest, like the rest of the world and how you talk, how you think, how you act, how you treat people, how you gossip, how you slander, how you uh, engage in sinful behaviors, what are you doing, right? You should look different. One of the primary ways you should look different is through your grace and your love and your mercy to those you encounter, right? Jesus says, people will know you're my disciples by your love for one another, right? Jesus says that. And so, uh, he put off that old self. But remember last week, there's like, there's this kind of this battle going on between old self and new self, right? So the flesh Maybe one engaging in sin, the spirit saying, "No, you're you're created for more than that." And so, which way are you going to follow, right? And so, we're to be walking in the spirit, in the likeness of God, in the true righteousness and holiness. It doesn't mean that you're looking down upon people and saying, "Oh, you sinners, those sinners." No, because but for, for the grace of God, there goes I. Is the mindset we should have, right? Even Paul says, "I am a chief sinner, the sinner among sinners." Paul even struggled with sin, but are you doing that? No longer walking that way. If, if you are a proclaiming Christian and it makes no difference in your life, some red flags should go up. You say, hmm, am I really a disciple of Jesus? I'm a disciple of Jesus. Really? Well, you know, I talk like the world talks. I think like the world thinks. I am just angry and bitter and unforgiving and harsh as the world is. What? It shouldn't compute. Put off that old self. That's why these things hinder you, actually. Paul says, throw off everything that so easily entangles you and run and press forward and run the race set before you towards the prize that is ahead, right? Because sin is not just bad behaviors, but it is holding you back. It is destructive. More on that later on. But I want us to, to see that. Then go on to uh, 7 through 15. We won't read it all. Uh, we'll just jump down to verse 15. 15. He says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. When you were in darkness, you didn't see clearly. But when you step in the light of Christ, you see more clearly now how you should be walking in relationship with God. Um, so walking among believers, how you walk among unbelievers. What about walking at home? Paul even talks about this, right? How do we walk as husbands, as wives, as children, as parents? As, how do you do that? Because here's the thing. If um, you're not living your faith out at home, you're not living your faith out at all, right? It's easy to come here and look like you got it all together. I'm doing my duty, right? I come to church. I, I even serve in the church. But if you're hard-hearted and unforgiving and unloving and unmerciful, Jesus would say, you do not know the heart of God. But you know how I know that? He tells the Pharisees the exact same thing. The Pharisees who kept any strict law better than you or I ever did or could, right? He would kept it. But they were not being merciful and loving and gracious. He said, you do not know the heart of God. Jesus tells them that, right? And so if you're not living out your faith at home, you're not living it out, you know? Now, it doesn't mean you don't struggle. We all struggle and sin and make mistakes. Let's not pretend we're perfect and don't make mistakes and sin. We all do. But I'm talking about your consistent lifestyle, right? That's what I'm talking about. And so, um, go to Ephesians 5.21. He says this, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so you see this theme, first of all, Paul's telling them, and walking in their Christian lives, submitting to one another, um, looking out for the interests of other people over your own interests, that you're, you're trying to um, uh, 
uh, not just thinking about yourself, but building each other up, right? And so I start with 521, why? Because many people will skip that. Some people will skip that and go right to 522, where Paul says this. Um, is it 522? Okay. Wives, submit to your own um, to husbands as to the Lord. And so right now, some men are like, yeah, see, wives, submit to me, the Lord says. But they forgot all about verse 521, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, right? Let's ignore 521 and go right to 522, right? And say, woman, submit to me, the Bible says so, right? Uh, but also, they'll skip these other verses, 525. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 528, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Or 533, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let his wife see that the wife, she respects her husband. And so, you know, some people just want to say, let's just do 522 and skip everything else. You can't do that. Here, here Paul is saying, this is what it looks like when you have mutual submission in these components of your area, right? So, a couple things. We don't have time for a whole sermon on it. Um, wives submitting to your husbands. Um, a couple things is, first of all, he's writing to a patriarchal society, right? They already were doing this. This wasn't ground... They were, they were already living this way. It was how the role of the male and female was. It's that way in many cultures today. Uh, and so we can look back now and say, you know, have your opinions on it. But they're already doing this. Paul is saying continually to live out this way. I think it's a, probably a, a good uh, um, thing at the very least to being like, well, don't try to be domine dominating your husbands. And don't try to be like the alpha male over your husbands kind of a thing, right? Uh, but, but also husbands, guess what? If you, that doesn't mean you can be this dictator ruler over your wife, because if you are doing that, this tyrant, you're not doing these things. You're not loving your wife as Christ loved the church, right? You're not even doing 521 about submitting to one another, right? Uh, and, and the last section there about husbands loving your wives and wives respecting your husbands, there's plenty of even modern day studies on men and, and, and relations of marriage and how, um, the idea of needing respect. Because guess what? If, if you don't function this way in terms of mutual respect and love and submission, you're going to have problems. You know, if you have a, um, a wife that is trying to dominate and be the alpha male of the husband, that's going to be problems. That's problems in many people's relationships today because we have a culture that is, has really um, celebrated that and you see a lot of breakdowns in relations because of that. If you have a, a man that is not loving the, the wife and you're trying to be this tyrant or dictator, breakdown in a relationship, right? Uh, and, and so it's this mutual dance of mutual submission, love, and respect. Paul even goes on further to talk about how this looks like in terms of children and, and relationship. Uh, and so in, in chapter 6, Paul talks about children, obey your parents, right? Meaning this respect them, obey them. But he doesn't stop there. And Paul says, fathers, do not provoke your children in anger, right? Don't exacerbate them. Don't provoke them. Um, and so he gives all these different practical standpoints, what it means to actually walk in your faith, right? From husbands and wives to bond servants to um, among believers, among unbelievers. So know your wealth and realize that, celebrate that, but then walk in that. Don't just know it intellectually. Walk it. Live it out. Make a difference in your life. If not, there's some trouble there. And it's for the unity of the body of Christ, right? Unity for the body of, of Christ. Last section, here we go. Chapter 6. The warfare of the believer. Hmm. The warfare of the believer. When you know your wealth, when you know the gospel, right? When you know who you are, when you know who you are in Christ, when you know who God is and what He has done and His mercy and His grace and that you're adopted, you are um, chosen, you are redeemed, when you know that and you celebrate that, and then when you walk in that, guess what? You're going to be in a battle, right? Because the Bible talks about this is a spiritual battle going on. There's spiritual warfare going on, Right? Because there's an enemy and many out there that don't want you walking in that. And so go to Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might 
may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's Paul saying, putting on this metaphorical armor because you're into battle. And again, it's the devil, I've said it a million times, but don't think about a pitchfork and a cartoon devil. That's a cartoon thing, but there is a real adversary out there, a real evil force, spiritual force, right? Fallen, the, the fallenness of, of the fallen angel and, and how that started this whole thing of where we are in today in terms of a broken world. And I know we live in a culture now where it's like, ah, oh, you can't think much about that. Because, I'm telling you, there's real evil existing. You're in a spiritual war, whether you realize it or know it. And I've, I've told you many times, people I know personally, from professors or pastors, um, well-educated, high up there people, who have encountered spiritual warfare of demonic activity, not just people that are crazy, but things flying around the room and like that kind of stuff. I've had people come here, not just one person, but people together coming and saying, we've all been seeing this um, dark figure and they keep appearing to us. And they, they were engaging in witchcraft and things like that. So there is real evil. There is an invisible evil war going on, realize it or not, except they're not. The Bible certainly teaches it. And so when you know your wealth, When you walk in your wealth, the enemy does not want you to do that. Right? What does the Bible say? The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Doesn't want you to be saved. Doesn't doesn't want you to be all you can be in Christ. Doesn't want you to go out and do kingdom things. Doesn't want you to love. And will throw obstacles in your way to try and trip you up. You know, sins, behaviors, attitudes, anything contrary to Christ will hold you back, pull you down, and has the potential to destroy you. I'm sure many people here know maybe someone that got entangled into something and it killed them. It destroyed them, right? It promises life. It feels good, but it leads to death. That's why Paul again says, throw off all those things that throw so easily entangle you and run that race towards the prize set before you, right? Having that mindset always. So when you face challenges and struggles and, and whatever, I'm not saying that means every time something bad happens, there's a demon behind every bush. No. But expect it when you, I'm sure maybe you've experienced it. When you're trying to get closer to God and you're trying to walk closer, something's trying to steal your joy. Something's trying to steal your peace. Maybe you're get back into an old temptation or a sin. Even Jesus was tempted. Even Jesus, Satan tempted Jesus to throw him off, himself off the Temple Mount, right? Uh, and so when you hear those whispers and when you hear those um, uh, temptations and when you see these things, whose work are you doing? Are you doing God's work or the enemy's work. But just know you're in a war, right? Know your wealth, walk in your wealth, you're in a war, realize that. And so when you find yourself engaging in sinful behavior or things that are counter to the Word of God, you're doing the work of the devil, uh, Satan, right? Um, And it destroys. And many times it will be a stumbling block from being who all God is calling you to be, right? But this is what Paul is saying. You're, 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 you're engaged in this war, whether you realize it or not. We live in a broken, fallen world. And, um, but the thing is, you don't have to fear it because God is more powerful than that. He has given us armor to protect ourselves and equip us and tools to, to use, right? The Word of God and all, all kind of stuff that we're not going to get into an armor of God sermon. Um, you have angels. You have angels that are for you, right? That are powerful than all evil forces. So you don't have to fear it. But be aware of it, right? And then lastly, Paul closes his letter with this in verse 21 and 23. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may also know how we are and that we may encourage your hearts Peace to you, brothers, in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all you who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Hopefully now, when you walk, go through the book of Ephesians, this will help you have a better mindset of the mindset of Paul and what he is trying to get across in this book. And when you're feeling down, when you're feeling, does God care? No. Know your wealth. Don't just know it. Walk in it and be armed for the battle that you will face. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everybody here. Lord, as we go through this book, we should be in awe of your mercy and your grace and your love because we are all sinners. 
We all need your mercy and grace. No, 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 no excuse to go on continuing this living life of sin, but rather we're called to walk different. But God, Father, help us to experience and know the wealth we have as a believer and the blessings. Let us have a joy and a peace and appreciation from that. Let us walk that way. Walk that way among believers. Walk, that, walk, walk the way we should be among unbelievers. Walk that way at home in our relationships with our um, hot husbands and wives and, and children and um, uh, business partnerships, whatever it might be, Father. And help us to see that this is all about your plan, your mystery of your plan that started all the way from the beginning of time, revealed in now in Christ as you adopted us into your family, Lord. Not based on what we have done, based on what you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ. God, let us know our wealth. Let us walk in that. Let us be prepared for the warfare as we go out of these doors, living kingdom lives, for building up the body of Christ as you use us to help advance your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen.